welcome to another edition of the eSpot with Camille. The eSpot is your location for the latest in entertainment, beauty, and design from the people who make it. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Janelle and Randy. Uh, we've been blessed. This is my first time at this festival, and we've been sold out. We had sold out Tuesday, sold out Wednesday. I did a, a yeah. special part and she grabbed her face and I felt it. Jesus. I felt I, I felt it yeah, and it made me and I, I, I ooh. So mm. I petted stray dogs and shy clear of dope. Mm. My smile is brilliant. My glance is tender. And I am noted most for my unspoiled gender. I've been made Miss Rheingold, though I never touch beer. And I'm the person to whom they say, you're sweet, my dear. <laughs> the only etchings I've seen have been behind glass. And the closest I've been to a bar is at ballet class. <laughs> Grim and proper, the girl who's never been cased. But I'm tired of being pure and not chased. Thank you so much. I love you. Hi, this is Camille again at the National Black Theatre Festival. I cannot wait for you to meet this actress that I'm here with today. She is playing the Eartha Kit. Yes, the Catwoman, the original, all of the, like she is a legend, a phenomenon. Janelle, yourself. Please tell everyone about how you got the part of Eartha Kit. I wrote it. That'll do it. So tell us more about how you come about with writing it. Because I wasn't being cast. I wasn't working. And I, someone told me years ago that I was going to have to uh, create my own projects. And at that time I had the actor's mindset and I was like, uh -huh, I don't feel like doing all that work. And then when I started seeing year after year after year of me not only not getting auditions but not getting cast, I said something's got to change. And so uh, it was almost a dare. A friend, a mutual friend of ours, said he would produce a show at the Fringe. And then about two months later, he passed away. And so I thought, well, I have to do this. He's he's kind of presented it. He's brought this up. I've, I've got to continue this. And so I took a workshop, about a twenty dollar workshop on how to produce at the Fringe. That was in January. By May, I had written a script, and by July, we had done three sold shows, out. sold out. All three shows were sold out before we even opened. And then the pandemic, and so I kind of shut down, like the rest of the world. And then I said, you know what? I got to kind of get this up and running and getting it out there. And I saw another friend of mine, she's doing Nina Simone. I thought, well, God dang, if she's doing Nina Simone, I could be doing her at the kit. And that kind of gave me a push to get it, to, to, to start uh, circulating the idea and seeing who would help me develop it. And then I just applied to this National Black Theater. It's my first time. I just applied and I said, all they can say is no. And they said yes. So I have to ask, what gave you that gumption? What gave you that drive? I mean, I know you said it's because you weren't getting cast, but to actually follow through on the steps. I don't start that anything and don't follow through. Okay. I, okay. I, if, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. It's just, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't not follow through. Keeps you up at night. It, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I say I'm going to do it, I've already thought about it and I've already uh, uh, analyzed it and how am I going to make it work and how am I going to do it and then I just find a way to do it. Okay, so what were some of the challenges that you overcame to give like some advice for anyone else who might be like, I'm tired of not getting my own job. Let me just create my own project. Um, the one, I've been told you got to get out of your own way. But two, um, uh, you know, there, there are days you, you don't feel like writing or you just don't feel like doing it, whatever that thing is. But you just got to find a way, even if it's 15 minutes. Uh, you know, or even if it's, you know, I hate to say this, but even if it's like a TikTok that day, something that's going to promote whatever it is that you want to do, you've got to do something that's going to further it along. 50, and, you, and, if it, and if that means starting with 10 minutes, that 10 minutes will, the next day you'll feel accomplished, you'll go to bed feeling accomplished, and then maybe the, tomorrow is 20 minutes. Then the next thing you know, it's an hour. That hour quickly will turn into a day. So it's, it's sometimes it's baby steps. I don't write every day. 
I, and I, I wish I did, but sometimes I, I'm doing other things. I'm, I'm directing a, um, a documentary now, so I'm doing, you know, and this is my first time. I don't know anything about directing. I'm not really a director, but I love the filmmaking process. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying something else. I love this. So how can everyone keep up with you, keep involved in what you're doing, and support all the amazing stuff you're doing? I mean, Eartha Kitt, come on. Thank you. Uh, one, I'm on Instagram. So I'm Janelle Lynn Randall on Instagram. Uh, I don't tweet. I'm not really a tweeter. I'm on Facebook, Janelle Lynn Randall. I think that's the, I think that's my name. And uh, you mentioned we, TikTok. Sorry. I mentioned TikTok. You know, it's funny. I created Eartha Slays, or I'm still Eartha, or something. I don't even know what my name is, but I created it, but I haven't done it yet. Okay. Because that's you know, that's a job. Oh my gosh, that, a full-time job. I take summers full off. I take I summers off. I yeah, I don't know how to do it. it. But I, I created so maybe when I go back home after this, I'll start putting out little, okay. you know, second reels, yeah. three second reel, or I don't even know how long they give you. How long do they give you? Uh, 15, 30 seconds. They See, keep changing. It, they keep changing. Every day. It's I'm more of an Instagrammer. I love Instagram. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, I am on TikTok. If it has something to do with Eartha Kitt and Janelle, that's probably me. Okay. Perfect. So, yes. so, one last question. How are you enjoying being in North Carolina and being part of the National Oh, Black come on. Because this is your first come time. On. This come is my on. first time. Yeah. And Black people are unmatched as an audience member. They are the fourth character in this show. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. When this lady I love grabbed us. her head her face yeah. last night, at a specific part in the show, and I felt her pain, and it immediately, it immediately I felt that pain. So I gave it, she gave it back, and then I gave it back. So I, I am, we are having, we hit the ground running. Like this is the best. You're black, and you have a, you have a project that you want to be seen. You apply, and no matter how many times it takes, keep applying and get here. Because you will meet people, you will network, you will, it, it will, it will come to fruition. Well, thank you again for thank being a part you. of the East Spot with Camille. Yes! I absolutely adore meeting you, and congratulations on all the wonderful success you have coming your way. I'm sure much more is coming, and you'll be getting cast in all the things from here on out. So thanks again. It was my pleasure to be on the East Spot. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, Janelle, I have a little trivia <laughs> for you. Uh-oh. Since you're playing Eartha Kitt, Eartha Kitt, as you know, was blacklisted because of what she said to um, Lady Bird Johnson. And she finally came back years later in a Pam Greer movie. It was called Friday Foster. And at lunchtime, time, I got to sit with Eartha Kitt. And you know, uh, growing up, I knew who that was, you know, some of the other actors didn't know, but I knew. I corralled her and I sat and I had lunch with her uh, one day on the set. An extraordinary, as you know, an extraordinary lady. So that's just a little bit of trivia for you. Friday Foster. Uh, I've done a couple of comedies here at the festival. Uh, one of my first comedies was a play called Soul Survivor. I did that here, and then I did Four Queens, No Trump. Um, they were really received well. They were comedies. Uh, they made you laugh. So what I want to do is introduce to you that, that I have a new comedy. It's called Blues in My Coffee. Now, in the Irish theater, they uh, do a lot of what they call bar plays or tavern plays, where the whole action takes place in a bar and they're drinking and the more they drink they tell their story or they have their conflict and they work it out uh i feel that starbucks is the place for the new tavern comedy because everybody goes to starbucks you go in you sit down you bring your uh, laptop or whatever and conflict can unfold there. So that's what I did. I wrote a play, Blues in My Coffee. We're gonna have a reading today at 4.30, upstairs, end of the hall, Hearn A, room Hearn A, second floor, here in the hotel, uh, 4.30. It's very funny, I promise you, I promise you, you will laugh. But at the end of the play, it will cause you reflection. It will cause you reflection. Now, 
I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a teaser. The play is about two black guys. One black guy is attracted to a white woman that he meets in Starbucks. And the other black guy is attracted to a black girl that he meets in Starbucks. And what I do is I point up the cultural differences between trying to get over with a white woman and trying to get over with a black woman. And uh, laughs ensue, okay? So, uh, uh, oh, the other thing is this. Neither woman wants anything to do with these guys. Mm. <laughs> We're here with the Ted Lang. He's worked on several films, TV shows. Of course, you remember him from The Love Boat. But now he's here at the National Black Theater Festival. So I really got to find out. How are you enjoying being here at the festival? How's it going for you so far? I come every year. I love it. Uh, I'm a playwright also. Some people don't know that. And I'm doing uh, my latest play. It's called Blues in My Coffee. And it all takes place in Starbucks. And so that's the coffee angle. And the blues, you have to come see the play with it. Oh, it sounds good. Because the blues, yeah. Yeah. The blues definitely does come into it. So how did you make that transition? Were you always writing scripts? Did you start off that way? Or was it like whenever you had, I guess, some of those, everybody goes through it as an actor when you have some time off. Did you start writing scripts and just put yourself well, in those scenes you wanted? I tried to okay. cover my bases. I was already acting. I had done Broadway. I went out to Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, I found out about a film school called the American Film Institute. Applied. I got in. And then what they wanted me to do to kind of round you out as a director is they made you take acting classes, which I was already covered on that. But they also made you take writing classes. Okay, so I wrote uh, a couple of movies and I found out how hard it is to get a movie produced. But it's cheaper to get a play produced. So I've got about 14 film scripts, okay? And I get a, I got a lot of smoke blown up my sphincter muscle. So much so that I got cancer of the tonsils. And uh, so I decided that I would concentrate on plays because I could take uh, less money and put it into renting a theater, casting it, and putting on a production for six weeks. So right now I've got 25 plays that I've written that I go around to black theaters. And then when this festival happened, I had plenty of uh, you know, product to come and bring here. So I bring plays here, or sometimes I'm in someone else's play. And uh, because I did Love Boat, there's a certain notoriety that goes with me being here, and we get uh, audiences turn out because they love the Love Boat, and then they love seeing me do something a little different. Um, so I have to ask. So I know it was a million years ago, you probably don't remember, but it was such a diverse cast as well back then, which is something now they're starting to really make a point of trying to have that diversity. What do you think was the biggest difference or why there was such a push to have people of all races really represented in the love boat because i was over in europe watching it as a kid and i was like oh there's people that look like me yeah, yeah you know yeah, and it was yeah. like they're they can afford a cruise you yeah. know what i mean well, so, you know it wasn't easy because they didn't really want to do that they really wanted an all-white show okay and the network said well we want a minority in there and i got that gig the the network was actually instrumental in me getting the gig but me keeping the gig was a whole nother fight, okay? So uh, I fought. I, I talked to Don Mitchell, who was on a show called Ironside, because I was going to quit because they were really rough on me trying to get me out of there because they wanted an all white show, okay? And then Don Mitchell said, no, no, you got to stay. We talked about it because he had been in a similar position, being the only black person on Ironside when they did that on NBC, I believe it was. Uh, so uh, I stayed and I fought. Well, what happens as a consequence of that is because I'm there, they've got to do stories that would bring in my character. 
And the easiest way to bring in my character was have like Bob Dion, uh, you know, the different people, Verne Watson yeah. as a love interest, Tracy Reed as a love interest, because it was the love boat. I said, and I went to him, I said, you know, everybody's falling in love with me. <laughs> and he go, well, you know, we're not sure how to write that, how, you know, we, we're, we're not. Um, so what happened is, Bernie Coppell played the doctor, and Fred Grandy, who played Gopher, wrote a script for me. Wow. They wrote the script. Yeah. Actors wrote the script, and then they they kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah. And then finally I said to them, look, all you got to do is write a Gopher story. And then on the last pass, change it to Isaac. Because we're not an issues show. We're not doing like Saffron and Son or the Jeffersons or all. We're yeah. not doing that. We're talking about love. So you don't you don't have to hit any issues. Just write a love story. And so that constantly coming back at them and um, blossomed into what you saw when you were traveling through Europe. Wow. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate that you stayed and fought and kept that scene. Yeah, man. It was okay. really important. It was for not a easy. It was not, yeah, no. was not easy. So what advice would you give moving forward for anyone that might be in a similar situation where they're the only one, they're the token, or they're yeah. representing for yeah. us yeah. all? Yeah, yeah. How Perseverance. Do you stick it out? Yeah. Perseverance. Never address their racism because they can't see it. They can say, well, you know, don't you think it's a little... You can't say that. You have to come from a character. Do you think my character would do this? And the history that they film of your character. So what I used to do is when I did something in the show, I would make a note and keep the note on what they did that was universal so that when they came back around to another story, I would go back. I said, my history as Isaac on the show is this, you know? And if you go over here, you're you're going against what the character represents. But if we stay on that line, and then you got to give the suggestions because they don't know half the time. So you, you you work out about three or four possible scenarios for your character, and the right that's where the writing paid off. Okay, so because I was a writer, I would think differently. Um, and that's the main thing. And and the all and the other good thing is to always do the I don't understand routines. You know, I, I, I don't understand if Isaac doesn't like milk and he's lactose intolerant, I don't understand why you have him drinking milk in this scene. And they would go, Well, it's a good joke. I said, Yeah, well, let Gopher have that joke. Because my the history of my character is I'm lacto intolerant. You know, and the people are watching. Well, you know, they'll laugh. And I, no, the people are watching, and they'll say exactly what I'm saying to you now. So you got to, it's perseverance. It's uh, not addressing the racism to their face because you get very defensive and they call you names. And so you can't do that. But it always come from character and take a writing class. It doesn't hurt for you to know. Great doesn't advice. Hurt, yeah, yeah. Doesn't hurt for you. So is there any last minute things that you would like to share with the audience just to let them know what you're got up, having upcoming or anything like that? Anything? Well, I have a new play. It's called Blues in My Coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do that here at the festival. And uh, I'm writing all the time. I, I've got uh, 25 plays now, working on 26. So we'll see where that goes. And I've got about 14 screenplays, but I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to meet with Ogre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, well, I thanks got it. again yeah. so much for being on the East Spot with Camille. And I really appreciate meeting you today. My pleasure, Camille. Thanks. No, you can get it. Looking exquisite. No competition. Stay on a pivot. They be watching. They be plotting. She's so motherfucking independent. Mama be big. Got on her grind. She had to get out her mama house. Daddy be tripping. Now she be whipping. Ain't no more.